Welcome to our second video on arches achieving true arch action. In the previous video on this topic, we learned that achieving true arch action requires a horizontal buttressing force at the base of the arch to assure that the resultant support force at the base of the arch induces pure axial force in the arch. So we have the, here we have the arch. We need a force which is parallel at this point to the axis of the arch, or in other words, that's tangent to the arch. That force involves a vertical force, which is equal to half of the overall load associated with the arch. So if the load per linear foot is W, the total load over the span L is W times L, and then each of the reactions at each end will be V equals WL over 2. Then that means we need to have a horizontal buttressing force to assure that the resultant force is along the direction of the arch. Then we ask the question, what happens when the arch force is not provided? In other words, what happens when we go from this situation where we have all these uh, pressure uh, uh, distribution on this face that every one of these forces is parallel to the direction of the arch to this situation where we only have a vertical support supporting force? So we talked about, or we learned, that failing to provide the force can have catastrophic effects on the state of stress in the curve spanning element. In this example of the curve glue lamb element, which in cross-section is one foot wide by three feet deep in cross-section, and which is spanning 100 feet. Removing the horizontal buttressing forces, force at the support point, produces the following situation. It induces a bending stress that is more than 35 times the magnitude of the axial stress that would exist with the buttressing force. We then identified common ways to achieve, achieve the buttressing force. For example, using a huge rock mountain to provide the resistance to the outward thrust of the arch. Or we can use a tie member at the base of the arch. In this case, the tie member is visible for the Broadgate Exchange House in London. Or we can have a tie member at the base of the arch that's not visible. In the case of the Moscone Center, it is buried beneath the floor slab. Most of the time, we don't have, do not have a rock mountain to provide the buttressing force. Also, many times, we do not want a lot of tie members interfering with the volume that we are trying to create. In the structure above, the left image shows a series of tie members which, by the way, will typically sag substantially under their own weight. That deflection is substantially reduced when we provide sag rods, which is what these vertical elements are, which support the bottom tension member running from there to there, as shown in that image. So here we see substantial deflection at the same scale. We don't see anything there, meaning whatever deflection is occurring over here is negligible to what we're getting there. We can eliminate many of the tie members if we provide another structure to provide the buttressing force. In this case, we're showing a horizontal truss, which is basically spanning from this point to that point, and it's providing the resistance to the tendency of these arches to thrust out horizontally. So in other words, this truss 
is providing the horizontal buttressing force to all of these interior arches. Crucial to making this work is that there are still two tie members at the ends of the horizontal trusses. So the tendency of these horizontal tr trusses to be pushed outward is resisted by this tension member. So in essence, the cross-sectional area of this tension member has to be equal to what would have been required for this arch and that arch and that arch and that arch and that arch. In other words, four times as much force is accumulated here and four times as much force over there as would have existed in one of the original tension members that was providing the buttressing force to one of these interior arches. These two time members will be carrying half of the total force that would have been in all of the original time members. So the cumulative cross-sectional area of the two ties will be equal to the cumulative cross-sectional area of all the original time members. We have not saved any material in the time members. We have added cost to the material of material in the horizontal trusses but in paying that price by incorporating this horizontal truss, we have freed up this volume of all the tie members that were there originally. This diagram shows the loads on the arches. This image shows the axial for forces in the arches, the horizontal truss members, and the two tie members holding the horizontal trusses from splaying apart. This shows the deflection of the system. So you'll notice these arches are settling downward as they push outward and deform the truss. So at these top points of the columns, you see those columns are being pushed slightly outward because the horizontal truss is not infinitely stiff. The structure involves many interior columns that are dividing up the space. So all these columns here are dividing this space from that space. The function of those columns, these columns right here, can be replaced by a vertical truss that runs from one end to the other. So we end up with one column here, one column there, and a truss spanning in between. And that looks something like this. So instead of a whole series of columns along here, we now have this horizontal truss, which is picking up the horizontal, comp the vertical component of, excuse me, it's a vertical truss spanning from this side to the other and is picking up the vertical component of these arches. So now we show the load on that and we showed the forces and now we see these flags that represent the compressive force in the arch these flags that represent the compressive force in the top cord of this vertical truss down below we see a series of flags that represent the tensile force in the bottom cord of this truss and then of course we have all the truss forces that we had before in the horizontal for truss and also we have the tensile force that we've always observed in these tension members. And now when we look at the deformed shape, we see that the arches are settling downward as they thrust outward. Uh, we see both a vertical displacement of this truss and a horizontal displacement, that horizontal displacement being attributable to the fact that this horizontal truss is not infinitely stiff. We can sculpt the shape of this horizontal truss so that it is deeper where the internal moment is largest. So we're effectively replacing the 
parallel cord horizontal truss we had before with this uh, bow truss, or sometimes we call this a sling truss when the bottom cord is the curved truss and the top or is the curved element and the top cord is the straight element. So I'm talking about top, but I should be saying in this case, the compressive cord, which is on the left and the tensile cord, which is on the right. The tensile cord in this case is the curved element. So now we can show the load diagram on this truss and we show the axial forces again. And one of the things we see is that the axial force in this sling truss is more uniform uh, than was the case when it was a parallel cord truss. And we'll go into that, that issue in more detail in a subsequent uh, video. In the meantime, these are the deformations that we're observing for that structural system. And here we have a real-world example of a system where we have a whole series of arches, and these interior arches, which are running across here, have no tie members that are specified uh, specifically for those arches. So those arches need a buttressing force. And in this case, there's a tension member across the top here. There's a tension member here. And then there's this um, three-dimensional mutually bracing kind of truss, which has a triangular cross-section. And the net force in the arches is provided by the combined action of a horizontal truss, which is the upper face of this triangulated truss, or the truss with the triangular cross-section. That truss is providing the horizontal some of the horizontal buttressing force. And then some of the rest of the force is provided by the sloped face, triangulated face of this truss, which by the way, because it's sloped, it's providing some vertical component and some horizontal component. And you'll notice that these arches almost line up with the plane of that truss. So that truss is providing most of the force, but it doesn't line up perfectly. So on the top face of this triangulated truss is a horizontal truss, which you can't really see in this drawing, but that horizontal truss is contributing something to the horizontal buttressing force that's allowing these arches to do their job in compression. That ends our second video on achieving true arch action.